Good morning and welcome to this, our fourth AFB Outlook Conference. Today we have a focus on the future of the beef production in Northern Ireland and what the big challenges and opportunities are for the sector going forward, with a specific focus on where research can contribute. We've now ran a number of Outlook webinars, which are all available on our website, and these have covered topics like air quality, dairy production to 2030 and plant health. So quite a diverse range of topics which really reflect the science themes of AFB, which are leading improvements in the agri-food industry, enhancing our natural and marine environments and protecting animal, plant and human health. But today I'm delighted that we have our lead researchers from the AFB Beef Research Programme with us to present on their vision and thoughts for the sector. So first up this morning is Dr. Stephen Morrison. Stephen leads the whole research programme at AFB Hillsborough, and Stephen will give us an overview of the beef industry in Northern Ireland. We'll then have three separate um, presentations, and the first one will focus on societal expectations for beef, and that will be delivered jointly by Dr. Francis Lively and Dr. Denise Lowe. We'll take a few questions after that presentation, after which we'll then move into the second key topic around production efficiency and resilience for the industry going forward. And that will be presented by Dr. Francis Lively. Again, we'll take a number of questions when Francis concludes his presentation, and then we'll finish up with the third presentation from Denise Lowe on the environmental challenges facing the industry and opportunities to address them. So again, we'll take some questions after Denise's presentation. And at the very end, we are planning for a five to 10 minute panel session where we can discuss um, all the topics in a holistic nature. So folks, please do send in your questions. And if you're not familiar with WebEx at this stage, there's a, a down at the bottom right hand side of your screen, you should see a Q&A icon. So please do use this Q&A icon to type in your question. I will try and moderate that those questions coming through and make sure that as many of them are, are asked to the panel as possible. But with no further ado, I'd like to now hand over to Stephen Morrison, who will give us, as I say, an overview of the Northern Ireland beef industry. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Elizabeth, and good morning, everyone. Um, hopefully everyone can hear me okay. Again, as Elizabeth mentioned, I'm going to give a brief outline or background to the beef industry uh, before handing over to colleagues that will really go into a bit more depth on the challenges and what science can, can offer to address those challenges. So if you look at our industry, um, we're very aware that it is a big part of the Northern Ireland economy. Um, with a gross primary output of almost 430 million, second only to the milk sector, and a gross turnover of the associated processing sector of almost 1.4 billion. Coupled with that, it's a major employer. Um, directly on our almost 20,000 beef and sheep farms, but in our processing sectors and also in the supporting industries. If we then look at it, it does bring a significant amount of income into Northern Ireland, um, both in total sales, but also in exports, sorry, but also those exports go into both GB and to many other countries across the world. Again, those exports have been increasing uh, in the last 15 to 20 years, so again, an important part of income into Northern Ireland. Again, the industry itself very much helps support that family farm structure and it really integrated in that family farm structure that we have uh, and are very uh, positive towards in, in Northern Ireland. Um, if, we, if we look at the figures here, really about 12,000 farms within Northern Ireland have less than 30 sucker cows, but those collectively together that accounts for more than 50% of the national herd. Again, so a lot of the smaller herds uh, but represents a big proportion of the national herd. And many of these farms will be part-time farms as well, or part-time farmers, uh, of, often with off-farm employment in many other parts of, of rural Northern Ireland. Again, these farms, the beef farms, very much deliver and shape our countryside uh, and make it what it is today and what, what we love to enjoy. And again, 78% of our total Northern Ireland land area is used for agriculture. The LFA farms account for 70% of that farmed land and our 76% of our national beef herd is in this LFA area. So again, a big part of how our landscapes have been shaped and directed over many years. And beef farming itself not only generates um, the beef product, for, and that beef product's been generated from a product that can't be consumed by humans, such as grass. So converting that grass into a very high quality 
uh, bioavailable nutrient for human consumption, but also provides a wide range of further ecosystem services, um, such as carbon sequestration, nutrient cycling, biodiversity, etc. And, and colleague Denise Lowe will touch on these in her presentation later. But if we sort of look at where our beef, and beef farms are, um, we can clearly see that our beef farms are very much integrated and help shape our countryside. So the larger the circle on the map here, hopefully everyone can see that clearly, is, is a greater number of beef farms in that particular area in Northern Ireland. If I add in the protected areas and peatlands, you'll see a lot of those big, uh, large beef areas are very much where those protected areas and peatlands are. Add in our protected habitats and character landscapes, and you'll very much see the beef farms are integrated throughout Northern Ireland, integrated with our, our protected habitats, character landscapes, and the countryside we all uh, love to enjoy. But what is the, the main challenge out there facing our beef industry? And uh, clearly, the biggest challenge there is sustainability. And this spans beyond beef, but we're focused today on beef. It is the biggest challenge, but I also see it as the biggest opportunity for the industry. We're very well aware there's growing demands for energy, growing demands for water, and growing demands for food on a global basis. But again, to deliver on those challenges of supply, we have to do it in a very much a sustainable manner. And sustainability is a word that's often misunderstood or misused, and it's not literally taking one element on its own. So it's not just being profitable. It's not just protecting the environment. It is not just having a good standard of living for the primary producer. It's about bringing all of those elements together collectively. So often referred to as the three Ps, the people, planet, profit. So it's, it's having all actors in the supply chain having a sustainable income. Uh, it's having all farmers and, and all actors in that supply chain have a, having a good quality of life. The animals themselves having high health and welfare status. Um, the, the areas such as social isolation and rural hab environments, et cetera, all being addressed, but also protecting our planet. And again, obviously, the big challenge out there at present is carbon and carbon net zero. And again, today will be the release of the, the latest sort of CL report on how we can tackle that carbon net zero challenge. But the environment is beyond carbon. We've got phosphorus, we've got ammonia and a number of other challenges that we have to look at in that space. So if we look at that in a holistic manner and I very much stress the need to look holistically. Um, one such project that AFP has been involved in and leading along with Queen's University is the Food Futures project. This is a flagship project um, through Agri Food Quest um, and again involves 13 industry partners across Northern Ireland. And what that really is, is this holistic approach. It's bringing together all of those aspects of the three Ps and allowing the industry to both capture and credit the good behavior that's happening out there, identify any behaviors that could improve, and then help drive that positive behavioral change for Northern Ireland. So again, it's very much seen as the sort of world leading cutting edge uh, platform that we're currently developing um, for Northern Ireland to, to use going forward. Through that platform, we'll have informed management, informed marketing and improved product and enhancing that sustainability, which is the key thing we're really looking for. So again, uh, what we're going to really touch on today, there's, there's a lot of challenges out there. We're going to focus down on three of those challenges. We're going to look at societal expectations of beef. And again, what does, this, what does the consumer really need and what the consumer really want and what's the, where their preferences are? We're then going to look at the production efficiency and resilience to shock. And again, we're very aware of the shocks that are out there, be them on the climatic um, approach or on things like trade deals, Brexit, etc. So there's a lot of uh, shock in our system. Uh, and then we're also then going to look into the environmental impact of beef production. And again, not just carbon, but some of the other elements. And again, as, as I'll raise again, the, the, the very recent um, carbon net zero report, which will be released today, today that AFP was heavily involved in through CL. So again, without no further ado, I'm really going to hand over to, to colleagues, um, Denise Lowe and Francis Lively, who will take us, take us through the, those challenges and what, what science can offer to address those challenges. Thank you, Stephen, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Over the next 10 minutes, we hope to outline some of the key considerations that society expects of beef. And this is something that we believe has increased in importance over recent years and will continue to do so in the future. Consumers expect beef to be of a high quality, to be a high quality product, but I will outline some of their expectations and visions for the future. I'll then pass over to my colleague, Dr. Denise Lowe, who will provide some insight into the role that beef production has on the environment, uh, on farm health and safety, as well as the impact of cultural aspects of, of our countrysides. So we'll start by sort of looking at uh, what, what are the reasons why consumers uh, eat beef? 
Well, beef is a very good nutritious product and is an excellent source of protein, iron and many other essential vitamins and minerals, uh, which are all important uh, to support good health. The rec this recent report by AHDB identif identifies and summarises six main reasons for, for why beef is good for you, but there are many more similar reports available. Northern Ireland beef has a green image, and we proudly market our beef as being heavily produced from grass. This is an important marketing opportunity, as grass-fed beef has many benefits relative to grain-fed beef. For example, a recent paper by Daly uh, documented the benefits which uh, include more desirable SFA, uh, saturated fatty acid lipid profiles, higher precursors for vitamin A and vitamin B, which are good for, for people fi fighting cancer, high CLA concentrations, it's got a better uh, omega-3 to omega-6 ratio, higher levels of vitamin D. Uh, on top of this here, grass-fed beef has a lower fat content relative to grain-fed beef, and this also gives it a distinct flavour. Italians for the Future is ensuring that our beef uh, produced in Northern Ireland continues to be from a forage base uh, rather than a concentrate base. And secondly, uh, we do need to get some see look for methods to get added value or credit uh, for, for, for this product being pre uh, predominantly grass fed. A recent paper by Hitchin noted that consumer expectations could be grouped into three sort of categories. Uh, one looking at the credentials that consumers uh, expect from beef, then searches that they make when they're looking at beef, and then actual experiences when they're eating the beef. Uh, when the purchaser uh, goes to buy meat, uh, they might not necessarily want to see uh, evidence of everything, but they trust that those marketing the beef, let it be the butcher, the supermarket, or even the restaurant, have ensured that the product is of a known origin and has been produced to a high standard. And, uh, and they also want to ensure that the product that they're about to eat is uh, a naturally uh, produced, healthy, nutritious product. Within recent media coverage, the environmental footprint has also been well documented, and this will be discussed later by Denise. When the consumer physically goes to purchase the, the meat, they'll have to undertake a number of searches. These will commence with the price, followed by what labelling or branding or certification is on the meat. The consumer will then look at the meat uh, for physical appearance and look at the, the appearance of the meat in terms of physical fat content and also the colour of the meat. The consumer then has expectations for the consumption experience, and uh, they basically want a good overall eating, positive eating experience. And uh, they expect the meat to have a good flavour, be tender, but also have the ability to have a good shelf life. There's been a lot of research undertaken to establish the importance of eating quality of beef and its impact on consumption. A recent AHDB report indicated that if a consumer had a poor eating experience, they would not consider purchasing the same product for an additional 12 weeks. Our colleagues in Food Science Division of AFI were involved in a European uh, consumer study where meat from 774 carcasses uh, and 18 different muscles within those carcasses were offered to 15,000 consumers from five different countries. Within this study, 20% of grilled strip loin, 25% of grilled rump, and 54% of, of roast topside was classified as unsatisfactory. Hence, we have considerable work to do to ensure improvement in this area uh, is made in the future. In a scientific review by Hitchin, flavour was ranked the highest in terms of consumer, expect consumer aspirations. With this, with, this, with this group of authors indicating that uh, flavour is now uh, more important than, than flavour. However, consumers expect flavour to be of a acceptable quality. Sorry, tenderness to be of acceptable quality. Flavour, as perceived by the consumer, is a complex and challenging characteristic to measure. Contributing factors can be influenced by the production of the animal, the processing of the carcass, and uh, obviously the, the cooking of the meat. Meat flavour develops during the cooking process when a complex of thermally induced reactions occur between the non-volatile compounds of the lean and fatty, fatty uh, tissues within the meat. This results in a large number of reactions producing flavour precursors, and these precursors release odour volatiles and flavour, which end up being the flavour perceived by the consumer. 
we're very fortunate in AFI that our food science division colleagues uh, have the ability to measure flavour both using detailed laboratory methods, but also uh, through uh, uh, c consumer uh, evaluation in their sensory evaluation unit. However, a big challenge going forward is that our current grading and pricing system does not reward for eating quality. But based on the importance of providing the consumer with a good experience uh, to, to ensure repeat custom and repeat purchasing of meat, I believe this is a key challenge that we need to look at in the future. At this stage, I am going to pass over to Dr. Denise Liu to outline a few more societal expectations relating to beef. Thanks, Francis. Um, so I think that society is very aware of climate change and the environment, and there is concern in society about the environmental footprint of beef. So this is a typical graph of carbon dioxide equivalent per kilogram of product for different meats. And as you can see, ruminants don't fare very well. And indeed, beef and lamb have the highest emissions per, per unit product. But colleagues from Rothenstead have argued that this metric undermines red meat production. And it's actually more relevant to look at the impact on global warming in terms of the nutrients that it provides to the consumer. So we can see in the bottom graph labelled B that using this metric, that beef global warming is now much better due to its higher nutrient density. Another thing that beef often gets a hard time about is the amount of land that it uses. But of course, not all land is the same. And in this country, soils and climate are mostly better suited to growing grass rather than crops. And grazing livestock on this land allows us to turn plants which are inedible to humans into high quality, nutrient rich beef. So if we consider how much arable land growing crops is needed to produce 100 grams of different meats, we can see that beef needs less than chicken or pork. And if we look at the bottom graph, we see that beef performed even better when this arable land use requirement was expressed in terms of the nutrients delivered. So this really emphasises how important it is to see the big picture of the whole system. There can be unintended consequences if we just focus on a single metric, and this is discussed in more detail in the CL report that Stephen has mentioned um, earlier on. So society wants a high level of animal health and welfare, and the Northern Ireland beef industry rightly prides itself on our high standards that we have here. And indeed, at AFB, we have a focus on behaviour and welfare of beef cattle, such as in the OptiHouse project, which is looking at optimising calf housing for the future, and a recent project where we examined floors for house growing and finishing beef cattle. In terms of health, society is concerned about antimicrobial resistance in both humans and in livestock. So we need to be very aware of the role of beef producers in the targeted use of antimicrobials. The results of this survey carried out by AHDB are, are interesting because although society may feel that things like buying local or, or British meat that's quality assured with high welfare um, standards are important to them, as shown by the blue bars, the green bars show that actually become much less so at the point of sale. So society expects that the farm should be a safe place to work in and to visit. But over a quarter of farm fatalities since 2000 have involved livestock, where sadly 34 people have died in an animal related incident on farm. It's definitely an area that we at AFB want to address. And in a new DERA funded project that's currently underway, we're looking at what lessons can be learned from near misses on farm and also examining farmers' attitudes and the genetics of animal temperament. So we've heard from Stephen about how important beef farming is throughout Northern Ireland, and so it has a major role in defining our countryside, providing cultural aspects which are important to society, such as hill walking, natural beauty, and places of cultural um, heritage and spiritual value. COVID-19 has really focused society on the importance of the countryside to their physical and mental well-being. In recent surveys, there's been overwhelming support 
for protecting and investing in nature and the positive effect of spending time with nature on our well-being. So the COVID pandemic has really focused the public to appreciate this, the countryside that beef farming in Northern Ireland plays such a big role in shaping. And now I'm going to hand you back to Elizabeth. Thank you. Thank you, Denise and Francis. Um, to a couple of questions in here, and we'll maybe have time for about two. So the first one maybe is towards yourself, Francis. Um, considering the HDB data of a consumer having a negative eating experience and therefore not then purchasing beef for a further 12 weeks, is our grading system fit for purpose? Should we adopt a system like the Aussies? Yeah, uh, uh, for a good question, Elizabeth. Obviously, uh, we are an exporter of beef. We, we as we, we need to market our beef. We need to have consumers eating our beef. And if we have twenty to fifty percent of our consumers getting a, a bad experience, that's very negative for the you know for the saleability of beef. So really, to ensure that we are are, are marketing and like beef is a, a high priced uh, you know protein. So really we've got to ensure consumers are getting a high eating quality. So I think it is absolutely essential that we start to look at methods that we can actually reward the full supply chain for the quality of the meat that is being uh, sold to consumers. So yes, uh, we, we uh, our food science division have worked very close, closely with the colleagues in Australia and th throughout the world really. And certainly Meat Standards Australia does th that grading system and pricing system does offer opportunity for Northern Ireland, uh, you know, for the Northern Ireland beef red meat industry. And maybe just following on from that a little bit, Francis, you also men mentioned flavour. And I know that is really important whenever I go to, to have a bit of a steak in the evening. Well, not every evening, of course, but um, it is really important. And it's it's interesting to find that it's now more important than tenderness. So you challenged you know, the processors that maybe we should be looking at a payment structure for flavour and how we do that. But what are we in AFBI doing to support then the farmer and, and the, the process sector actually enhance and make sure that the flavour is what it's expected to be. Yeah, well, I suppose the you know in the past we looked at tenderness, and a lot of tenderness could be influenced post uh, you know post the farm gate. In terms of flavour, there are aspects that can be influenced at the farm level. So uh, we need to actually look at any production system that we're taking through. So we need to evaluate uh, basically utilise meat from animals that we are producing to look at any of our production systems that we're looking at and any of the new research that we're looking at. Uh, we'll talk later about some of the new adoptions in grazing systems that we might be looking at. So we need to be taking meat from that there right through and do both consumer panels on it, but also do more work more work more closely with our food science colleagues to actually use their laboratory techniques to actually identify what gives us this unique flavour and get a better understanding of that. And with that better understanding, that will give us a huge marketing opportunity. So, uh, you know, we have the capacity within Appy, Appy to do that, and we, we, we work collaboratively together to, to achieve that there. Yeah, so it's really just calling out the need for that holistic look at, at you know, key impacts from the farm right through to the, the flavour yeah, on the meat yeah, is be, even more important for consumers. Exactly. And we've got to, you're absolutely right, we've, we've got to not just look at one aspect of the chain, we've got to look at the whole chain together. So we've got to look at the, the production aspects, uh, what we're feeding to our animals, how that influences the, you know, the, the flavour, and then right through even to the cooking aspect. So there's, it is complex, but it's possible to look at it. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Francis. Um, and, and Francis, you're up next. Um, I now invite you to share with us your presentation, which is focusing on production efficiency and trying to put some resilience into the system for all the shocks that come down the line. So thank you very much, Francis. Thank you, Elizabeth. And hopefully we'll soon presentation here. Yeah. So uh, thank you, Elizabeth. So really, uh, we've already heard uh, from Stephen about the importance of production efficiency and resilience to shock in the future. So really, we'll, we'll just start by looking at what is the key challenge and what certainly what do I see as the key challenge for the industry going forward. And uh, profitability I see from a production level is a key challenge to, to the beef sector. The year statistics indicate clearly that the net uh, farm uh, income of beef and sheep farms, regardless to whether in the LFA or the lowland, uh, has been very low in comparison to some of the other sectors. 
when we compare the net farm income minus uh, direct payments, it is clearly evident that the beef sector is heavily reliant on direct subsidy payments. If we compare then trends over recent years, uh, we can see that uh, although uh, you know the beef sector is a lot lower, it is slightly more stable than the uh, th than the dairy sector. However, the big question that remains is what does the future hold? The FAPRI report produced by AFPI and indeed a recent uh, presentation made by Andersons does not indicate very positive uh, uh, indications going forward. Consequently, production efficiency is going to be a very key, a very important uh, driver to, uh, or an important aspect to be able to drive uh, pr uh, profit profitability in the future. In terms of profitability, where is our current state of play? Our AFPI's developed bovine information system has shown some improvements in terms of cattle being slaughtered at younger ages. Uh, but there remains a massive variation. The, the, gra the figure there shows a massive variation in the performance of livestock, with AIDS only accounting for 5% of the variation seen in, car in, in carcass weight. So what are the potential reasons behind this? And they range from genetics, nutrition, production system, uh, farm management practice, quite a number of, uh, of potential reasons. In the interest of time this morning, we can't go through them all, but I'll try, I'll try to go through a few of these uh, just to give an insight. The current nutritional guidelines for ration and beef cattle in the UK were published uh, over 30 years ago and relied very heavily on data produced from Hillsborough and the D-Dollar uh, Research Institutes in the preceding years prior to that. Consequently, it's no surprise that these guidelines are rather outdated. AHDB have funded a research project called Feed into Beef Nutrition to revise these guidelines, and we are currently working in partnership with SRUC, CL, and a number of industry partners to deliver this project. Through modelling AFPI and SRUC data, we aim to deliver more accurate guidelines for the, for, 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 uh, the future. The, these improved guidelines will not only lead to improved uh, animal performance and production efficiency, they should help to reduce production costs, feed costs, uh, and they should also improve the proportion of carcasses meeting the desired carcass specification. They will also be important for modeling GHT emissions from a range of uh, beef production systems. Grazed grass remains the cheapest feed for ruminants in Northern Ireland, with concentrates being the most expensive. Concentrate usage fluctuates from year to year, but overall, our usage within the beef industry uh, remains quite high, and I we really believe there is opportunity to reduce this in the future. CAFRI uh, Sucker to Beef benchmark data indicates that farms in the top 25% uh, produce a, approximately an extra 100 kilograms of live weight per hectare than those in the bottom 25% through carrying a higher stocking rate. And what is also interesting, they use less concentrates. This indicates that improved, that improved physical and financial performance can be achieved through improved grassland management. However, I acknowledge weather conditions and labour constraints on farm can limit the full potential of grass. So looking to the future, we need to explore opportunities to make grassland more, more resilient. And we'll look at some of those in, in some of the next slides. A recent survey indicated that only 16% of beef farmers in Northern Ireland actually measure grass. Looking to the future, new technology must offer low labour solutions to enable this uh, to be wi more widely adopted. For the success of ration and beef cattle and ensuring that the nutrition is optimum, it is equally important to monitor the performance of the animal against the, 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 the quality and quantity of the feed being offered. Relying on market weight or cold carcass weight is too late for making improvements at the farm gate. Going forward, it is essential to measure, monitor and manage to ensure improvements can be achieved. AFPI have developed some online growth monitoring tools that are, that are available on the uh, BOVIS portal, uh, and these can help farmers going forward in the future. We've already heard how grazed grass is the cheapest feed available for beef cattle. 
So it is no surprise that methods to extend the grazing season will be beneficial to the industry. For example, one recent study showed turning store cattle out in the spring 17 days earlier resulted in higher, uh, heavier cattle that autumn. Indeed, they were increased by 23 kilos live weight. Another recent study showed uh, grazing store, young store cattle at grass on autumn grass reduced the feed cost by 62 pence per day relative to cattle that were kept in the house on grass silage. So really in both these scenarios, silage requirement and slurry production were reduced and modelling would indicate that such practice would also lead to lower ammonia emissions from that production system. However, we all know that growth and supply of grass is not uniform throughout the year, nor is grazing conditions uh, uniform either. And this is frequently, this is reported weekly through, through uh, grass tech. Looking at how we become more resilient in the future, we need to consider some alternatives for grasses such as multi-species swords. Findings from recent research uh, projects throughout the UK and Ireland uh, are showing positive aspects to, these, to, to such diverse swords. The varied species within the swords allow for different root depths that can help soil structure, and this can be beneficial for, uh, in, in the spring and autumn time. Also, the deeper roots of some of these uh, uh, plants can help uh, during periods of drought, and we have certainly saw drought over this past few years. There are other options, other alternative farming systems, such as silver pasture, and they may have a role in the future as well. AFPI is part of a large European research consortium called SuperG. And within SuperG, we are evaluating a range of options to make uh, permanent grasslands more resilient for the future. And we look forward to seeing some of the results from this project being presented over the next over the next two to three years. Another recent study by AFPI has showed that grass per utilization and production per hectare can be increased by 19 and 42 percent respectively from moving from a typical three three to four day rotational grazing system paddock system to a system whereby animals are offered their daily requirement. Uh, using grass measurement. Uh, so this is a substantial improvement in, in grass utilisation and production of live weight per hectare. However, we know from a recent survey that approximately 50% of beef farmers in Northern Ireland still operate a set stock grazing system. And so the reasons for this are mainly down to the lack of time. So time availability and land availability is the major barrier. So obviously, with this being a barrier to the ability to adopt best grassland practices, we do need to, to look to some novel technology for the future. And one, one such area may be virtual fencing. Within the Super G's consortium, a number of partners, including AFI, are interested in the role of virtual grazing technology and the role that this could have in the future. Such a system uh, uses collars to direct the animals, and these can be directed by uh, someone using, their mobile, using a mobile phone app. We believe that embracing such technology can reduce the labour requirement on farm. It can also add precision to the grazing system. Not only can you manage the grazing, but you can also monitor where animals are grazing and how uh, areas within the field is performing as, as shown on the, 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 grass, the, the, the picture on the right, right hand side of your screens. Whilst adding precision nutrition to the grazing platform, it is now possible to use te uh, technology to more strategically offer concentrates to cattle whilst at pasture. A recent PhD student at AFPI offered grazing animals either no concentrates, concentrates offered as part of a group, so group fed concentrates, or strategically offered concentrates through a piece of equipment we, we procured with uh, CL. And in this equipment, animals were able to be offered concentrates individually. The end result was more animals on the strategically managed group reached their target life rate at the desired end point. Moving forward, using the available data that we have on weather, on forage quality, 
and on our knowledge about nutrient requirements of cattle. We should be able to make improved management decisions and use new technology to really get to the optimal end point of, you know, bring our cattle to their optimal end point in a more cost effective manner. While stone technology, animal health can have a major influence on the performance of animals. With losses through mortality and morbidity being a high loss, a high cost to the beef industry. Early detection of ill health is critical to reducing the impact of disease on lifetime performance. Advances in technology such as automatic calf feeders that monitor the behaviour and the performance of the animal, or boluses that when inserted in the rumen monitor the temperature. Both these technologies have been shown by AFPI to be viable options to improve the health and performance of, uh, of young stock moving into the future. However, as indicated in my very first slide, the beef sector is working on very low margins. So these future technologies need to be affordable. So in summary, low profitability is a key challenge to the beef industry going forward, but improvements in production efficiency will, will be vital to drive profitability. Use of revised nutritional guidelines, coupled with the monitoring of performance, will have a huge importance for identifying cost-effective production systems that help get our carcasses to the desired uh, specification at the correct time. The full potential of grass has not yet been exploited by the beef industry. Challenges brought about by weather may be overcome with multi-species swords or adoption of different farming systems. And new technologies, emerging technologies, do offer a pot potential and assistance to beef farmers in the future. However, these will only be adopted if they are labour efficient and cost effective. Thank you. Thank you, Francis, very much. Um, we have a couple of minutes for a couple of questions. And the first question here maybe is quite easy and, and quick to answer. With regards to the precision supplementation of the concentrates at grass, in, in talked about the PhD student project mm -hmm. and, the, and the use of the precision feeder, if you like, at pasture. Um, did that did did the precision supplementation at grass reduce the overall amount of concentrate fed compared to the group feeding? Yeah, the, basically the the it, it's all about using data and information, Elizabeth. So if we know the quality of the grass, we know the availability of the grass, and we know the required performance of the animal, we can automatically uh, ricin the animal according to its requirements. So at grass, there's periods of time when uh, you might need very much concentrates because grass can actually uh, deliver the, the performance from the animal. So you can essentially uh, gradually increase and decrease uh, depending on grass availability and grass quality. So uh, overall, you should be able to lower the concentrate requirement rather than just routinely going out and feeding a group of animals. The other aspect, within every group of animals, you'll have high performers and low performers. And uh, you know, you, you some animals will not need concentrates, whereas other animals within the group may need pushed on. So uh, you can sort of, you know, rather than, I mean, that's particularly important in the beef system. Thinking of finishing cattle and cattle not becoming too fat, you can really, uh, you can target the performance, and this will all be important for meeting carcass specification. Because at the moment, we do have quite a lot of cattle not meeting carcass specification. Yeah. So that smart feeder. That we have there, and we trialled its use. My recollection is it did reduce the overall amount of concentrate yep. fed, and the result was a higher output per kilogram carcass of carcass, the yep. animal. So there was a win-win yep. on both sides. Yeah, a win-win. We just need to get it. Uh, you know, we, we need to look at how that can be adopted and make integrated use of the data, and then become commercially viable for future for for the future. Yeah. Other question here relates back to um, the Fibnot, as I call it, the Fibnot project. And so, do we have a feed efficiency figure for typical Northern Ireland beef production out there at the minute? Uh, no, is the answer for that. There, we we don't. But certainly, what we are doing at the moment, Elizabeth, on that project is we have we have a lot of data gathered from Hillsborough. So the data that we the, the guidelines we currently use were published by AFRC in 1993. So essentially that was data from the 1980s and 1990s. So we now have data from the 
you know, 2000 onwards that we're actually using and we're going to model that data. So it's more typical of Northern Ireland conditions. Uh, so over the next, uh, over the next probably 18 months, we are modeling that data uh, to actually come up with revised uh, models and we'll be able to quantify that. We also would like to move to the scenario. And I think linking in grass, we need to be able to quantify uh, beef production from grass. Uh, we, we very often have uh, milk. We know, you know, the, the, the milk production from grass. We don't have that value for beef at this stage. Yeah. OK, thank you, Francis. And I and recognise there's a few more questions coming in, but we'll take them in the panel session. I'm keen that um, we come back to them. They'll be very suitable for the panel session. So thank you, Francis. And I'll now invite Denise to present on the last topic this morning, which is around the environmental challenges um, in the beef industry. So thank you, Denise. Thank you, Elizabeth, and thanks for the opportunity to explore some of the environmental challenges that the beef industry faces over the coming decade. So the beef industry isn't immune to environmental pressures, greenhouse gases, ammonia, phosphorus, and of course, loss of biodiversity. So why I acknowledge all these environmental pressures, I'm going to concentrate on two this morning, greenhouse gases and biodiversity. But AFPI, of course, has major programmes of work on both ammonia and phosphorus. And you'll be aware of the series of webinars that took place last week on ammonia and also the research focus on phosphorus and catchment projects, looking at the effect of phosphorus on water quality. So we should always consider the pollution swapping effect and be conscious of these other potential pollutants when evaluating the effectiveness of any mitigation strategy. So that whenever we reduce one pollutant, that we don't inadvertently increase another one. Climate change is our biggest environmental challenge. And you'll be aware that the UK government has committed to net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. But 27% of emissions in Northern Ireland are from agriculture, and they've remained quite static really over the past 30 years. In other sectors that emit greenhouse gases, there's only one way flow into the atmosphere. But agriculture is in the really unique position where it has potential to be part of the solution. We have this massive land area that, if it's properly managed, can be a carbon sink. And maximising the capture of carbon is key to the agricultural industry achieving net zero, as mitigation alone won't be enough. In beef systems, we can capture carbon dioxide in photosynthesis of the plants that we grow, and we can sequester carbon in soils, trees, and hedgerows. 68% of, Northern, Ireland, of uh, Northern Ireland's agricultural emissions are from methane, which are produced by enteric fermentation and manure storage. So that definitely does present a challenge in the beef sector. 22% of the emissions come from nitrous oxide, mainly from nitrogen fertiliser and animal manure application onto the land and urine deposition by grazing animals. So I really want to, to highlight this diagram because soil is the absolute fundamental basis for our beef systems. And beef systems provide many of these ecosystem services or public good. And I just want to highlight a couple. Beef production in itself is an ecosystem service providing food to an increasing global population and an anticipated doubling in the world food demands by 2050. We've already heard from Dario Fanara in the SAFBI series of webinars about the abilities of soils to sequester carbon. And Dario highlighted that grassland soils in this country can sequester between 1.1 and 2.2 tonnes of carbon dioxide per hectare every year under common management practices here. Nutrient cycling is so important in beef systems, as while the soil and the soil infrastructure and microbes are fundamental to the beef systems, equally well the beef system is fundamental to help attain a healthy soil status. So what I feel is the vision for environmental sustainability in beef for the next decade. I think that environmental sustainability will be part of every farm business in this post-Brexit era. Some systems will be driven by intensive production, but I'd argue there's still a role to enhance the environment. Other systems will focus on enhancing the environmental ecosystem services 
with less of an emphasis on production. It's really important that if we're to address environmental challenges, that we need to take a holistic approach, approach to beef farming, looking at all the ecosystem services that it provides. So if we look at the opportunities to minimise greenhouse gases in beef production. The more productive the animal is, the lower the emissions will be on a per unit product basis. So there are major opportunities to improve our production efficiency and health status, as Francis has highlighted already. And these are win-wins, both for profitability and for the environment, and indeed have been shown in MAC analysis to be cost beneficial. Thinking about what we can do with the diet of beef cattle, Francis has talked about how we can increase our precision feeding, so we're minimising losses. And AFBI are also currently involved in a number of collaborations looking at manipulating the rumen microbiome and using feed additives such as seaweeds, oils and 3NOP to reduce methane. And also you can see in the photo that we have world leading facilities with our calorimetry chambers here at AFPI, which really are the gold standard method of measuring methane. So we know the benefits of genetic improvement in that it provides a mechanism for permanent and cumulative change. Scientific evidence would suggest that genetics could provide a significant long-term solution to reduce GHG emissions, as methane emissions are a heritable trait. Since methane emissions are difficult and expensive to predict, genomic selection could provide significant long-term benefits to accelerate genetic improvement in the future. Genetic improvement in production efficiency traits can also drive a reduction in GHG emissions and this has been illustrated, for example, in Irish beef selection indexes. However, Northern Ireland urgently needs to embrace this going forward. There is a massive opportunity in genetics that Northern Ireland could harness to address our GHG emissions. If we now look at how to reduce nitrous oxide emissions in beef cattle. We see potential mitigation is mainly around inclusion of clover and improving efficiency of nitrogen nitrogen fertiliser. We've already heard from Francis of some of the benefits of using multi-species hordes in beef systems, allowing us to cut down fertiliser application in the summer, and so reducing GHGs, and also the different species act at different levels in the soil to avoid losses of nitrogen. The graph on, on the right-hand side is some work carried out at UCD in a project that AFB was a partner in called Smartgrass. And it shows the, the potential for reduced nitrous oxide using multi-species swords. So multi-species swords have huge opportunities for our beef systems going forward. I want to move on now to think about potential carbon sinks in beef systems. So Francis touched on this a little bit, but this is a project that was carried out at, at Afby Loch Gall, where three land types were compared, permanent grassland, silver pastoral system and woodland. When the scientists looked at soil carbon stocks 26 years into this project, they found that soil carbon wasn't different between the three land types. And actually, when they looked at different soil aggregate fractions, there was evidence that carbon in the systems planted with trees could be more resilient and the carbon stayed locked longer in the soil for longer. So there's real potential in silver pastoral systems for beef cattle because they're not only a carbon sink, there's also evidence from this project of many other environmental benefits, including enhanced biodiversity, recapturing of ammonia losses and reduced water runoff. Hedges are a, a very typical part of Northern Ireland landscape. And Jonathan Blair has recently finished his PhD at AFB, where he looked at carbon sequestration of hedgerows. And if we use a conservative figure of 1.5 tonnes of carbon sequestered per hectare per year, that would equate to roughly 94,000 tonnes of carbon dioxide sequestered from hedgerows for all of Northern Ireland per year. So the challenge really going forward is to get the right management of hedgerows within Northern Ireland beef systems and to utilise technologies to track and monitor hedgerow carbon sequestration so that this carbon sink can be accounted for. As well as carbon sequestration, hedgerows also provide nature corridors which are important for biodiversity. And biodiversity is a really important environmental challenge for the beef industry going forward. 
This graph shows us that the most important driver for loss of biodiversity in the UK is indeed intensive agriculture. But the good news is that agriculture can provide solutions for biodiversity loss and beef farming can play a really important role in that. I think there's something here for every beef farmer to improve biodiversity on their farm. Whether you farm in the uplands or in a lowland intensive system, there are options such as planting trees or creating ponds or nature corridors or sowing multi-species words over an entire paddock or wildflower strips in a more zoned area of the farm. I want to highlight a project that has just started at Athby in the summer called Hubs, which is Hills and Uplands for Beef and Sheep. We want to look at a really holistic approach to see the synergies and trade-offs between all these ecosystem services, as there are unique opportunities in the uplands if they're managed properly. So we're scoping out the information to see what we need to measure and how we can verify those measurements as we plan ahead for long-term projects in this very exciting area. This graph on the right demonstrates that important habitats could help lock away vast sums of carbon. The study looked at peatlands and heaths in the UK to estimate how carbon could be sequestered if they were all restored to favourable condition. And you can see the massive potential here of restoring these habitats. Restoring these habitats could lock in 14 million tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent per year. And this represents nearly a third of the UK's annual agricultural emissions. However, we're failing to utilise the full benefits of these important habitats, as many are in poor condition. I want to re-emphasise the holistic approach to beef farming, and part of the cultural aspect of this is the well-being of the farmer. So I want to finish by putting the farmer at the front and centre of this piece. They need to get credit for providing all these ecosystem services for public good. And we need to think about how we make beef farming an attractive career for the next generation and how we mitigate against land abandonment. So then just really to summarise, production efficiency and high levels of animal health are important in mitigating GHGs. And areas that we really need to harness are the power of genetics and, as discussed by Francis, the role of technology in optimising these. Current mitigation strategies alone aren't enough to get to net zero, so we need to maximise carbon sequestration in soils, trees and hedgerows. We have to work together with other sectors, not just agriculture, but also Lulu CF and energy and transport sectors all working together. We need a holistic approach, looking at trade-offs with all and synergies with all the ecosystem services that beef systems can provide, including food production, air quality, water quality and flow, and biodiversity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Denise. And I'd ask Francis and Stephen to go back online. Um, just to take through um, a panel piece now, um, but maybe before we get to the panel piece, um, just see, to have a quick look at the questions. Does the panel feel that the net zero by 2050 is possible for Northern Ireland beef production? So maybe today you can I'll, yeah, I'll come in with that. Um, in terms of, of beef systems, we, we're, we're some way off, Elizabeth, we're some way off carbon neutrality, and it's going to be a massive challenge for the livestock industry in Northern Ireland, undoubtedly. Um, and we're always going to have emissions of GHGs in the beef sector because it's part of the biological function of the ruminant. Um, and so you know, things that I've mentioned in terms of mitigation of the animal themselves, like like the diet and health and genetics, you know, will potentially bring that down maybe by by 20%, something along those lines. So we also need to, to look at Lulu CF and, and how we can sequester carbon. And I know that, you know, in our previous uh, seminar with Dario, he looked into that, you know, in, in more detail, but but we need to get credit for what we can sequester on our farm. And um, for example, you know, I mentioned the hedgerows and, and we're not getting credit for that. But even even with those things, they we we do need to have you know, a lot of, of new carbon removal technologies, Elizabeth, you know, that that, that will be the key to getting to, to carbon neutrality. And, you know, a lot of those are n 
st still need more work and research to, to have them out in the industry. So there are there are you know several things out there that that are being investigated, like biochar and and um, bioenergy and using biomass and things like you know direct air uh, carbon capture and storage. But we we need a we need a big investment in in both at the research level and at the industry level on these technologies. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you. I'm going to now move to the kind of general topic of genetics. There's been a couple of questions in here, and I'm going to summarise them for folk. What would the impact of genetics be, and what could the impact of genetic improvement be with regard to feed efficiency and greenhouse gas emissions, etc.? They all talk to each other, so maybe I'll give that one to Stephen. Oh, quite a specific one. Um, so, like, uh, genetics is a big area that. We we've under probably underinvested in um at Northern Ireland level and we do have to make a a concerted and, and, and controlled effort in that space. And um, the most recent figures that I have anyhow were the rate of genetic gain in our beef industry is approximately valued at about two million a year. Um but with a relatively small amount of effort that could be more than doubled quite quickly. Uh, and because genetics is a cumulative effect it adds up year on year on top of each other so the the benefits are could be colossal if we can get a sort of aligned strategic development when it comes to genetic gain and, and, and as your question talks on that gain will come both on productivity profitability but also on our carbon footprints also on our ammonia outputs uh, and would also um, be directed more in the areas such as longevity of animals replacement etc and again even linking back to what francis had mentioned in his presentation the, I, I know colleagues in the south of Ireland have recently launched their genomic evaluations for meat eating quality and um, sensory. So again, the, the space uh, and science is moving fast, and, and Northern Ireland has to jump on that and capitalise on that quickly. Thank you, Stephen. There's there's another a uh, couple of questions in here in around you know we've got Brexit coming up, we've got imminent changes to pricing um, uh, payment structures. And just in light of that, you know, how and, and working back into your talk as well, Denise, and your talk, Francis, around um, resilience and grass utilisation and the benefits that can have for ammonia and greenhouse gas emissions and biodiversity, etc. Have has the panel got any thoughts on how best farmers could be rewarded going forward through any new payment structure in a post Brexit era? Yeah, I I maybe start there, Elizabeth. Um, undoubtedly, Brexit's a challenge for for the beef sector in Northern Ireland. But looking at the, you know every cloud is a silver lining. There there are opportunities um, to for our devolved government to work up policy that's best suited to Northern Ireland. And you know we have this public money for public good, so we're really putting environmental well being at the forefront rather than the background, and and where farmers can can get credits. For, for providing this public good. So it's really around how do we verify those credits and you know what is the value of, of, of public good. And um, so we're going to be getting away from direct payments and how do we how do we uh, really um, credit the farmer with providing the, the, the public good? I think just following on from that there, Denise, I think, you know, linking back to my presentation, one of the key aspects, you know, for the industry going forward is obviously driving profitability through production efficiency. And one of the key aspects that farmers are going to have to adopt going forward and the industry is going to have to adopt is basically measurement. And this measurement to actually quantify what grass growth, quantify what carbon we can lock up in the soil, quantify how much grass is in the diet, quantify how much concentrate usage we have on farms. And that's going to be vital to uh, probably shape some of those uh, you know, things going forward in the future is having the evidence base. And certainly within the Super G project that we're involved with, and it's really just looking at uh, sustainable use of permanent grasslands right throughout Europe. We do we do want to, to, to do that there. And one of the uh, work packages that, that, that we lead here in AFB within that is to develop decision support tools. And hopefully those decision support tools will give uh, some assistance to producers to actually quantify the, the, those measures mm -hmm. and then give, give informa important information then to policy to uh, drive how, how future payments may, may go in the future. Sure. And indeed, that the Super G project's very much building that evidence base, as is then the Food Futures project, if I'm right, Stephen, to, to bring that evidence base together to see then how it could work together 
to actually produce some kind of a payment and provide advice to policy on how it could provide a, a payment structure? Yeah, very much so, Elizabeth. And Food Futures is about um, crediting the, those three pillars of sustainability in a scientifically robust manner with evidence and data. And that is set up in such a way that it's using existing knowledge and data, but also being future proof for the new developments, such as the LIDAR mapping that, that our colleagues are doing in the catchment programs, etc. So um, it's very much about evidence, as Francis says, because be it a policy, be it a consumer, they want every information, are all actions based on evidence. So this, yeah. this provides that basis. Okay, I'm conscious it's 11 o'clock, but there's another elephant in the room that I think we need to answer, and that's GWP star versus GWP. If GWP star comes in, could any of you postulate on the impact that could have on carbon footprint? Oh, I'd say, I'd, I'd, I'd say very quickly that if, if GWP star comes in, it's a benefit for the Northern Ireland beef industry. Because as we know, methane only lasts in the atmosphere for now, current thinking is maybe, um, you know, decades, um, maybe even as low as 12 years, um, where things like carbon dioxide can last for hundreds, centuries, you know, so um, GWP star will will mean that that um, as as methane goes out of the atmosphere, uh, that beef farmers are getting credited for that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Elizabeth, I'll just, I'll, well, sorry, I'll just jump yeah. in for a second. So, yeah, it, it could have a reasonably big impact. Um, and this is one of the proposals we're actually drafting at present is to evaluate that potential impact if it does move to a GWP star sort of metric. Um, mm -hmm. So, again, we're, we're, we're in that space and looking yeah. to, to model that out. The counter challenge, of course, is the fact that methane is such a toxic gas in the atmosphere, and, and that could well have the potential to balance out that the fact that it could be counted for a shorter time. So it, it's potential to be beneficial, but yeah, well, we couldn't it, take a call on it just yet, I don't think. Well, I think that, that the sort of overarching outcome is that we have to look at multiple metrics. Yeah. Um, and evaluate it from a wider base rather than one particular metric. So again, we will be looking at this and modeling the impact uh, along with these other range of metrics that are out there. Sure. OK, thank you very much, Stephen, Francis and Denise for your time this morning. Um, thank you to all the attendees as well. Really enjoyed having your company. And if we didn't get to answer any of your questions, we will follow up separately. Um, just to plug very quickly, we're on a roll with webinars and we will hopefully be having an, a series of three webinars now coming up during October, looking at the soil to the sea. And this, the first webinar in this will start on the 15th of October, and that will be very much looking at catchment sciences at the terrestrial level. And we'd really invite you to look on the AFBE website if you haven't had any notifications to date um, to register and get more details about those forthcoming webinars on the soil to the sea. But for now, thank you, everybody. Have a good day. Bye-bye.